G'day, it's Jeff Lewis here from Seriously Series and welcome to another episode of Unique 4x4. Today we've got a very unique vehicle on the show and a very unique gentleman too. He's taken a very different approach to exploring this wonderful world we live in. It's a machine that was ahead of its time and even by today's standards it is impressive with the amount of technology in it. Is it a Range Rover Sport? Is it a Disco 4? Well, you're just going to have to stay tuned to see what it is. showing this van in a different light. It could be luxurious, it could be agile, and it could have the performance, if not the same, if not better, than a sports car. And that's what they achieved. With a 3.5 litre V6, with putting out 224 kilowatts of power, with front and rear differentials out of a Nissan Skyline, and also independent front and rear suspension, giving it a low centre of gravity, its on-road performance was second to none at the time. What made this possible was a five-speed automatic transmission. This had also been used later in the Nissan Patrol, making a very tough and durable drivetrain, allowing it to have the ability to go to some of the most rugged, remotest parts of the world. We've got a very unique vehicle. Back when it came out in 2002, it was the cutting edge van on the market. It allowed power, finesse and refinement, but it could take you to some of the most rugged parts of the world. It uses a 3.5 litre V6. It also uses a cutting edge automatic transmission using Skyline differentials front and rear which are open. Some people might criticise this as not having such a good off-road capability, but what I've actually seen this van do has actually changed my thoughts completely. So, to find out more about this van, we've got Jason here, and Jason's going to be taking us through what he uses this van for, and what he has done to this van to make it, in his mind, one of the ultimate off-road vehicles out there on the market. So, welcome Jason. How we going, mate? Very good, mate. Very that's good. good, that's good. So, very different train of thought, Jace, isn't it? Going for something like this, as opposed to the Land Cruiser and the Nissan Patrol. Do many people sort of make that comment to you regularly? Oh, I do get a few looks because, uh, as you know, I take it on the beach and in the sand dunes and probably areas where people don't expect to see a van like this. <laughs> uh, most people generally see it and it's not ultra high or anything like that, so most people generally think it's two-wheel drive. Yep. yep. Um, and, and one of the features that sold me on this van is that it's actually a transfer case four-wheel drive. Right, just right. just minus the low range. So that, that's quite an unusual feature that you tend to find in a more of a soft-roaded design, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it is. It is a bit unusual, and um, I thought having that would be a good basis for having a little bit of off-road ability. But I'm not looking for extreme off-road. Yep. yep. Um, which is one of the factors why I've gone for the more soft-roader style of vehicle. Um, I started out many, many years ago with not much money and had old Holdens and just, yep. just two-wheel drives and used to spend a bit of time out the bush. Yep, yep. Um, moved on as time went on and had a couple of proper four-wheel drives. Um, on the budget I had, couldn't get anything excellent and even back then four-wheel drives tended to be more trade and sort of 
just basic. More sort of agricultural yeah, use. Yeah, more, more agricultural yep. sort of yeah. uh, You didn't sort, sort of, of have feel. the comfort and the refinement. That no, you there, were, there were a this. few starting to come out, but back then they were out of my budget. And what and, vehicles uh, were these in particular? I had a uh, Mitsubishi Triton. Oh, okay. Quite um, a capable vehicle. Yeah, that, that was quite good. And I had 33 mud terrains and did a body lift and all the stuff that young kids do. Right, um, right. Okay. Had a Holden Jackaroo short wheelbase. Yep. And uh, they, they were both quite good vehicles, but I just I, I just found proper four-wheel drive a bit unfulfilling in my adventures. Yep. And um, ended up moving to the soft rotors, got into Hondas, and I just love Hondas. So um, mo moving to the more the soft rotors, did you find you were limited at all by... At first I felt it, it was just a feeling driving out of the bush, just felt like I didn't have the clearance. Was it more of a vulnerability feeling or just more yeah, of I a so. lacking of being able to go where you want to go? No, or? I think it was more just, just in, in my head. Yep. It, was, it was more a mental thing that, oh, I haven't got the clearance to go here and there. And when I first drove out, kept coming from 33 inch mud terrains to a little soft roading Honda. Mm go out the bush and see a stick on the road and think oh I'm gonna gonna break something but <laughs> it, it just wasn't the case and as I adapted and got used to it mm. and, and then started doing things like going a size bigger in tires nothing extreme and maybe a 20 mil lift so were there and, any um, pivotal moments there that you went this this is the way to go this th is there, the there were pivotal moments and they were trips that were only partially off-roading yep so you yep. might go several hundred to a thousand kilometer sort of away from home and so you might have like 80% highway driving. Yep. And so you'd go off in the bush and have your fun and you come out on the highway and I just get out on the highway and go, I think this is just a really great vehicle. And, and yet it took me everywhere that I wanted to go. And, and I'm not looking to go extreme. I'm not looking to do rock crawling. I, I just want to travel and, and basically a touring overland vehicle. And what you've said there, which I think is really quite interesting for the viewers here in particular, is the fact that most trips that we do, and particularly here in Western Australia, it is such a large state. You can easily spend six, eight hours on the road, as you know very well. And you're only travelling somewhere to do probably 20 kilometres on a track. So 80% on road is really quite attainable, isn't it? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah and, and I find a lot now. I'm just looking to. Yeah, I'm just looking to get to the destination. So, for example, if we want to go there. And there's a river crossing that's clearly very bad and a couple of trees down stuff like that and it's a bit easier path i'll just take the easy path cause yeah yeah I'm, I'm not looking to prove anything to myself I yeah just, just want to get to the destination with uh out damaging the car really i think it's one of those things that comes with the grace of time you <laughs> uh you get stuck out there a few times and then you go no no i'm not going to ford that river that's up to the bonnet i can quite easily tackle the bridge next to it so yeah no, and i, I have done my time going out for a one hour drive and getting stuck and having to come back the next day and get the vehicle and then when you get it there's repairs to do so I've, I have been through that process and done all of those things. Mm. Well, I guess I guess what you've sort of found now is a, a medium between the two you're still getting the, the thrills that you want going out there on your actual adventure but you're not pushing the vehicle and the constraints of that vehicle to the point where you've got snapped axles, blown differentials, you know, having to replace the whole interior because, oh, you got stuck in a bog <laughs> hole halfway up and the seals didn't work. So, yeah, it's, it's, it's quite yeah, interesting. absolutely. I'm just about travelling and, and mm. seeing the countryside and uh, the flora and fauna along the way. And, uh, and uh, I just wanted something capable, but that doesn't have to do extreme stuff. I just want to drive along the beach dirt tracks, lift a wheel here and there and, and, and get and to the destination. Do you document any of this online at all, Jason? Oh, I do. I have an Instagram account for my travels in this van and oh, that great. is uh, overland underscore adventures with an A uh, underscore Oz. Now, did I miss something there? Is there a pun in there at all? There Jace? is a pun in there. Uh, as you know, uh, I do like a good pun. You certainly do. Yeah, Don't so, uh, adventures has become adventures. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing like a good bit of dorky dad humour there just to spice up a video, <laughs> hey? So, yeah. Well, look, we'll get a little bit more into this van and we'll look at some of the unique features that this van has to offer. So, with a van such as this, Jace, obviously most people who buy a four-wheel drive vehicle, the first thing they do is they go into a, I guess, aftermarket distributor store and they go and try and get a massive body lift or a suspension lift and tyres as big as they possibly can. But I imagine that's not quite the case for this vehicle. Is that is that right? Yeah, it is a little bit harder to source uh, 
aftermarket parts. In fact, they're probably almost not existent. Right. So, for, so for what a vehicle like this? What do you do there? How do, um, how do you well, go about one that? of the first thing, well, one of the first challenges I had with this car, which I knew before I bought it, was that it's pretty much a low rider. Right. So, the, and this particular, this is the Highway Star, and this one in particular was lower than some of the other models. Right. So it came out as, as a low rider, pretty much. Um, so one of the things was I knew I'd have to get a fair bit of lift and this vehicle doesn't look like it's sitting here. It looks pretty stock standard, but it's actually got a reasonable amount of lift and okay. I've achieved about about 50 mil front and rear. Well, that's certainly nothing to snigger at 50 mil. No, it uh, certainly helps. And I, and I found just, just mold alterations, a little bit bigger in the tires, a little bit of lift, especially with these soft rotor vehicles that you're not going extreme anyway, definitely really helps just some mild, mild changes. So what I've done, in the front suspension, I actually went into Pedders, and uh, this vehicle is actually a combination of Nissan Patrol, Pathfinder, Navara, but your basic sort of Nissan four-wheel drives that come out in Australia, it's a mixture of their running gear. Right. So, so in, in the front, I've got a combination of uh, Pedders, Pathfinder struts and springs. Yep. Um, and that's how I've achieved the lift there. They've put camber bolts in, so it can adjust the front camber. Wow. Um, tires I've chosen to go just one size over standard in a Yokohama all-terrain. Okay, how have you found the Yokohama? I really like them. I like yep. them a lot and I've run them probably for six years plus now. Wow, that's a long time to be running a particular make of tires. It is. I just I get long Ks. The last set on this I got about 62,000 kilometres out of. Wow, that's, that is impressive. And they also, Yokohama, offer a road hazard warranty and um, I've utilised that a couple of times and that's where I've staked a tyre and they've actually replaced the complete tyre free of charge. You're kidding? Wow. So that is, that is quite impressive. I don't think there's many tyre manufacturers out there that actually offer no, such I a don't service think so. that I've so, come across. So that's one of the reasons. So they've, they've been good, they've been long lasting. Um, the previous style was a little bit more aggressive in its, in its pattern yep. and I did like that. However, having said that, this is slightly less aggressive in the looks, but it actually does perform as good, if not better, off-road. And I guess this van in itself, you spend most of the time here in the gold fields and obviously on the coast on the Australian Bight. So naturally it is quite a sandy soil here. And obviously being in a coastal environment, it is obviously sand. So having probably a less aggressive tread necessarily isn't a bad thing. No, and I think it does help on that mm. on that softer material. Mm. I, I don't think you need that that real aggressive. You don't need that mud terrain. It, it just pulls you straight into the sand. And as you said before, as you touched upon, you know, you're doing probably 80% on road too. So you want something with a slightly harder compound yep. that's not going to wear down too quickly. But one thing I just wanted to um, have a chat chat to you about with just with regards to the audience, you were mentioning about the the camber of the actual tyres and themselves. Because this doesn't have a live axle in front, does it? No, it's independent. It's uh, McPherson struts up front. Right, okay. Um, which is like a lot of your Japanese, especially your smaller vehicles. Yep, yep. Um, probably not so common on your bigger bigger four-wheel drives. And right. we haven't mentioned yet, but this vehicle, even empty, weighs over two tonnes, about 2.1 tonnes. Right, that's that's quite a bit of vehicle to that's move. That's a lot of vehicle to pull along. Yes. That is, I can <laughs> see why you've got the 3.5 litre V6 underneath the hood then. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, okay, so that's that alone is quite an advantage compared to a, nu a number of other off-road vans out there because you've got the actual differential is in the centre and is actually quite higher up. So therefore you've got nothing to worry about with regards to actually hitting on obstacles as you're yeah. going over. Yeah. Right, right. And for the back of the vehicle, did you have to change the springs up there at all? At or? the back, uh, once again, Petters sorted that out for me. Um, I was unable to, at that time, get any aftermarket shocks, so I've just got some KYB sort of standard replacement shocks, um, which has helped the ride quite a bit, especially the rebound, um, as opposed to the original shocks that had 200,000 kilometres on them. <laughs> That's um, quite a few. <laughs> originally, uh, Petters put in V8 Falcon front springs. Right. Which were the right, they matched up the diameter and free yep. length and all that. Did it make it go uh, any faster at all? Unfortunately not. Oh, so, although what a it pity. is not. With, with the uh, three and a half litre V6, it's no slouch anyway. It's, oh, pre it's pretty good. <laughs> certainly not. <laughs> and um, yeah, so they put those in, which were quite good. It gave 
I think about 60 mil lift, but of course once I load it up, it comes back down a bit. But I found over time, while they were good initially, they sagged quite badly and pretty much went, went back to original by the time I'd done several thousand kilometres. Yeah, yeah, so I've only just recently got it sorted out and I've now got uh, Y62 ah, patrol springs. Right. The new independent V8 patrol, I've got the rear springs out of that. Once again from Petters in the back. Right. And it hasn't raised it a heap from where the Falcon Springs were sitting. However, once I load it up, mm. it just doesn't sag like it did. So it's. But I, I've gained loaded. I've probably gained about thirty mil of height. That's not bad at all. Which which leaves me with the with the legal sort of fifty all round. And I guess the difference that you're looking at there between the the Y62 and the Falcon. Uh, coils is actually the diameter in the actual spring itself. Yeah, now I think there was about two mil, only two mil difference, but that makes all the difference. Oh yeah. A and they're about 20, 20 mil longer free length in the spring. Now, with all this lifting of the vehicle and everything, it, obviously you haven't gone extreme, obviously extreme is over two inches of lift, and then you've got to start looking at changing the overall, starts changing the overall geometry of the actual drivetrain. You haven't had any problems with anything sort of scraping or not performing as it should? No, it's all performed as it should. I have had a couple of things um, unrelated to suspension just because it's a bit lower vehicle and it's got plastic covers underneath. So dr drive over a bit of an obstacle and, and snag that. And I've, <laughs> I have ripped the, the plastic shroud off, but at some point I'll get fabricated an aluminium sump right. guard and all that, bit of a bash plate. Okay. And uh, I'll get that fabricated up. Um, what else? I've had a few maintenance issues, but I think I've got that all sorted out now. Yeah. Just just had to do a few things. It's an import vehicle and it is 2003, so yeah. you've got to expect to do a few things. So, If I wanted to go out and actually buy an Al Grand Jace, how would I actually go about it? They're not overly that common. They're not I, I that would... common, but uh, there are, are many more uh, that I'm seeing even even in the outback regions, I'm seeing one here and there. Oh, fantastic. Crossing the Nullarbor, I saw several of these exact model yep. driving along. So um, yeah, I j just do your research, just uh, your normal spots where you'd hunt down cars and uh, type in Nissan L ground, of course, and- And off you go. And look for the features you're looking for. Right. And is there any particular uh, things that we need to look for in buying an L ground? Is it is there rust bearing issues or anything to do with the electronics? I think they're generally not too bad with the uh, with the rust. Uh, they do go through wheel bearings, right? Um, and the front ends, as you know, I've just done a lot of work in this front end. <laughs> spent spent thousands of dollars upgrading this front end and getting all the bushes and ball joints and all that sort of stuff done. New steering rack. So I would say just test that steering listen for knocks and squeaks and stuff like that especially the front end and yeah wheel bearings bushes and ball joints that sort of thing just just make sure they're all up to scratch when you're buying second hand well that's something pretty general that you'd look at any vehicle that's about 20 years old or so i would imagine yeah of course of and course. have you had any issues with the, the actual airflow in the motor itself Oh, the, the airflow's been all right. They are a bit hard on uh, the airflow meter. Right. So I have replaced two of those in probably a two year period. So yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I got about a year and a half, two years out of an airflow meter. Right. And I, di I did hear something with regards to the, the cathodes in the actual exhaust itself. Yeah, they, they do have, um, with the, th these cars have four catalytic converters. Four. So wow. you've got V6, you've got your exhaust come out each side and there's two on each bank. Um, they do have a habit of the front cat falling apart and blocking in the rear cat. Right. Um, so you've, there, there's a couple of things you can do, it depends who you talk to with the legalities of remo removing catalytic converters. My understanding is as long as you've got one in that line you're right. Yep. Um, so the option is to either have that rear cat removed and put in a straight bit of pipe. Yep. Or you can just have both cats replaced with aftermarket cats. Right, yeah. okay. And then you've got new cats and you should be right. Oh, well, that's not too bad coming from obviously Land Rovers and that, where you need to know every little foible. So that sounds pretty <laughs> straightforward to me. And so for the future of this vehicle, what, what have you got planned for it? Any any trips, any further modifications to it? Well, there's always trips trips on the go. I want to, want to, want to spend more time down in and around the bite and see a bit more of that and the the uh, south areas of uh, Western Australia. Uh, I do love the beach. 
I do want uh, at one point want to head across to Steep Point, the westernmost point of uh, Western Australia. Oh yes. I want to tick that off the list. Want to do the Air Peninsula. Yes. Yeah. Um, as far as the car, it's it's really getting to somewhere that, that I'm I'm quite happy with. Um, I have toyed with the idea of just not heaps, just a little bit more lift, maybe about 20 mil. Um, and maybe docking the front and rear bars or bumpers and, oh, okay. and putting on a little bit of bar work. And that'd be something custom that you'd make yourself? Yeah, it'd have to be custom. Right, yeah. right, right, right. Well, that'd make it a very formidable piece of gear. I think it would. Right. And, of course, I do a lot of night driving, so I do want to get some auxiliary lighting on here at some point. A uh, light bar up the top? or Yeah, either a light bar on the top or even a light bar or a couple of spotties on the front once I get some bar work might, might Fantastic. work. Fantastic. Yeah. Fantastic. Great. Yeah, thanks for uh, taking us around the van today, Jace. And that has been absolutely fantastic, seeing a different, I guess, train of thought applied to off-road adventuring. And uh, the fact of the matter is, too, that it's very unique with some of the modifications that you've done, too. Well, uh, thank you for having me on the uh, show, Jeff. It's, uh, it's good to be featured, and uh, I'm looking forward to seeing this video come out. And, uh, yeah, it's good just to promote something that's a bit different to uh, your standard four-wheel drive. I think that's what we're all about here really, just looking at something a little bit different and hence the name Unique 4x4. Yeah. Now, we did mention earlier that people can actually follow your adventures, the highs and lows and all the rest. And yeah, jump over on uh, Instagram, overland underscore adventures with an A underscore Oz. And we'll be sure to put that link in the content section below. So please click on it and please support Jace as he goes off on another massive adventure. Anyway, join me in the next episode of Unique 4x4. As I always say here, if you want to see more videos like this, please click on the subscribe button below. And if you want to become a part of what we do here at Seriously Series, please click on the Patreon icon and become a patron of Seriously Series. Anyway, I'll catch you later.